A lot of things change, you know, when you're used to going 200 miles an hour and all of a sudden life has other plans in store for you and you come to a dead stop. Just before midnight on July 18th, an IED went off behind me, killed my fire team partner. A secondary explosion went off in front of me. The official report says it was a hand grenade off my fire team partner's vest. I thought I was dying. I was like, my, my jiggler was, was cut. So when I saw that, I didn't even put a pressure on it. It was like, I just let myself die. So I looked at this guy, it was a great blue sky. I was like, wow, this guy is beautiful. I'm gonna miss it. When soldiers come back from any, even if it's an exercise and there was a traumatic accident or an incident, or again, like the Afghanistan campaign, Soldiers are changed. A part of them is left over there. It's tough to look in a former friend's eyes and know that they're there, but you're lost. And I've lost guys that are gone, like they're not coming back. And I've lost guys that are still here and they're still present but they're not coming back, you know, and it, it sucks. It really sucks. No, I want to make my family proud of my service. I want them to, even if I came home in a box, I want them to be, stand there and be like, what he did, he did because he wanted to go, and we're proud of what he did. In the heart of the Canadian Rockies, 12 recovering ill and injured soldiers from the Canadian forces are participating in a mountaineering training camp. It is the first step on a personal journey that will take them halfway around the world to the Himalayas, where in the shadow of the world's highest peak, Mount Everest, they will be pushed to their limits as they attempt to climb the 20,305 foot giant known as Island Peak. My best wish is to be jobless because there's no more job. <laughs> this is my biggest wish. Unfortunately, there's, it's not the case. I'm not out yet on an oath of the out, but uh, many people say you can take a man out of the army, but you cannot pull out the army in front of a man. And sorry, the translation got a little bit bad, but it is, it's, it's the same. It's, uh, it's a passion, it's, we love it, I love it and I wish I could continue. Even my paralyzed hand, I don't know if I'll be able to continue, but I wish. I like distraction. It helps uh, keep it real. It's not just sitting in a classroom style learning. You learn that uh, there's always gonna be something out there that, uh, that will take your mind off stuff. You just gotta keep focused. Island Peak is the final phase in my two-year-long journey. Not only my two-year-long journey, but the two-year-long journey that my family embarked upon. So. My husband's done uh, four hot tours. He's gone to uh, 
Cambodia and Yugoslavia. He's been to the Gulf War in Afghanistan. He's got some residual issues that he's also dealing with that we've had to work through as a family. But he's so supportive. He, he knows how much I believe in my job. I go home sometimes at night and just so emotionally drained because you want to give so much to your troops. Oh, these, the way they uh, unfold. The first opportunity, I guess, that I've been able to to be able to give back to what I like to call the military family. Uh, and the foundation's been able, or is allowing me to do this. So again, I'm pretty stoked about that. The soldiers' climbing expedition to Island Peak is being facilitated by the True Patriot Love Foundation, whose mandate is to raise awareness and funds for recovering Canadian soldiers, with the hope that the expedition will help heal their emotional, mental, and physical wounds. The soldiers, as, as I'll tell you, just the fact that they're working together as a team, this is something that they're used to doing as, as soldiers. And we deploy them all over the world, and they work together as a team. And when you're back from those places where you're no longer in the forces and you're a veteran, you know, you, you lose a little something, right? Can I continue to serve? And so not only are they working as a team, not only are they overcoming obstacles, they're working together to serve our country again. It's going to be a lot of closure. There's a lot of self-doubt when I first got home from, with my injury. Um, I've lost some, some nerves in that area. So I've, I've wondered, you know, if, you know, if I go do this, this march or go do this or that, is it going to flare up? Is it going to cause problems? But uh, I'd like to go challenge it, and make sure it's all good to go. I've always volunteered in my life, and this is a chance to uh, do something great. My dad, my brother, both in the military. Uh, this is this is for them more so than me. I can say I've, I've been craving something like this since I've been home, and uh, I've been looking forward. I haven't been able to find it yet. So coming here, uh, I find it feel like I'm back within a group that I can really relate to, and uh, yeah, it feels like I'm home again. Kathmandu, mythical, sweeping, the center of the Himalayan mountaineering universe, and a place where spirituality and reflection burn softly through day-to-day -day life. It's here that the soldiers will make their last-minute preparations before embarking on the climb a chance to take stock before the odyssey ahead. Amongst worshippers at morning prayers, they too must make peace with their future and their past. Everybody comes home from a trauma different, I and mean, whether you're a policeman, a fireman, or even just an average everyday person, you know? And I mean, average everyday people are the best in the world because they're who we all want to be. I mean, regardless whether we wear a soldier's uniform or a firefighter's uniform, yeah, we want to be able to hang up the uniform and just walk out into the community and just be normal. It's not often that you have so many days concentrated to work on yourself physically, emotionally, and mentally, and be surrounded with such an incredible group of people, like-minded people that are going to push through, give their all, try their best for a cause that they believe in. The day of departure from Kathmandu has arrived. The Island Peak Expedition Team arrive at the airport for a short but heart-stopping flight. Small mountain aircraft take the soldiers from the relative comfort of Kathmandu to the remote and unforgiving high Himalayas where their trek begins. The flight is considered one of the world's most beautiful, yet dangerous journeys. The 50-minute trip from the vast urban sprawl of the Kathmandu lowlands traverses the lush Nepali foothills, 
and skim several high passes before the dramatic descent onto one of the world's shortest commercial runways. The touchdown in the Sherpa village of Lukla completes the transition from the soldier's dream that was born in Canada to the harsh reality of the adventure that awaits them. The curtain has now been raised in this alpine theater, and the actors of the drama take the stage. Over the next 21 days, the soldiers will march over 150 kilometers. The distance, however, is misleading, as the trail rises and falls dramatically along the contours of the mountainous Himalayan terrain, making the journey harder. If they top out on Island Peak, they'll have gained over 16,000 feet in altitude from their starting point in Kathmandu. How well their bodies adapt to this gain in altitude will ultimately dictate their success or failure on the climb. So I was in a wheelchair about two years ago. This is hot. Sorry. You probably could have wheeled that thing over here, actually, with the right manpower. A very long first day ends in darkness as the team reaches its first night camp in the village of Phok Ding. kind of thing and just being here to be able to help get everybody else up up to the top everyone else who's who's still fighting the battle like, like myself all the work. so the water gets pushed in here it gets forced through the ceramic and it comes out the tube at the top okay yeah I don't mind working actually but uh, at the same time I do have a work detail each day and uh, I'm one who usually puts my hand up first just like Matt over there so here we are how the whole thing as the soldiers fall back into the familiar role of life as a team, pulse and oxygen saturation levels will be tested continually. It's an essential reading to gauge how well the soldier is adapting to the altitude. In the Himalayas, a low saturation reading can be as deadly as an avalanche. See, there we go. Do you know a resting pulse? Oh, yeah. 68. All right, so I'm expecting to see probably low 70s. Here we go. Okay. My ACL ligaments have been, have been repaired. I have next to no meniscus left. So there were times yesterday where I thought, wow, this is, if this is day one, uh, it's going to really push me to, to get to the top. The path up the Kumbu Valley to the high mountains has changed little over the centuries. It remains a steep, narrow, uneven track that is the thoroughfare of the Sherpa communities. All goods for the expedition have to be carried on the backs of animals or men. There are no shortcuts for the soldiers. They must walk every step. I'm feeling great. Yeah, really, really good. No problems with my uh, pelvis or my femur. So that's good. That's what I was worried about. I think this is bridge five. First one was a little... Uh, nerve-wracking. They kind of bounce too though. There's someone behind you that's a little heavier than you. It's kind of like jumping on a trampoline with uh, someone bigger. Rosanna Mandy was born in Moncton, New Brunswick, but now calls her small horse farm outside of Ottawa home. Married with two sons, Ethan and Everest, 
She is the section commander of a support center for wounded soldiers and their families. Rosanna has first-hand insight into the struggles of the soldiers she counsels, having badly injured her pelvis and femur in a training accident in 2010. We go through a lot of tissue where I work. I try not to, um, but uh, it's pretty hard for, for soldiers that come in. Many of them haven't worn their uniforms um, in a long time, some of them a year, two years. Uh, they just can't um, for whatever reason. A lot of times they don't feel like they're worthy, that they don't deserve to wear the uniform anymore because their bodies aren't whole or their minds aren't whole. I know I had a really hard time putting mine on. I try to, uh, to maintain um, a professional relationship. Try not to talk too much about my own personal injuries aside uh, from just saying that uh, I've been on the other side of the desk and that I do sympathize and I can feel empathy. I'm thinking I've got a lot of days to think um, and to, uh, to strive to find that balance that I'm searching for. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking that I'll probably dedicate one day to uh, all of the special people in my life. For Frank Dupere and Peter Bersev, the island peak climb is another thread that binds their deep and lasting friendship. Both Montrealers, both born on the same day, both decorated war veterans, and both blown up by suicide bombers. I remember that specific day when uh, Frank got hit. We were on patrol uh, in uh, Zangabad. We came back, we heard over our uh, computer system that two Canadians were injured in Talucan and I was worried. I didn't know if it was Frank or not, but at the same time, I knew it was him. I even thought for a split second, I said, no, I don't see my, myself carrying his coffin, because I knew that if, if he was dead or if he was gonna die of those injuries, I, I'd had to do that. And I said, no, no, this is not gonna happen. I... He's the only other guy that I know that went through a suicide bomber attack, so. <laughs> And he got injured also, so yeah, maybe like he's the kind of guy that wouldn't understand what I go through. I know it's create bonds that you won't live with, you know, even friends that you have forever. It's in the civilian. You don't live like such intense feelings with those guys. You spend six months in a row, seven days a week, 24 hours a day with those guys. You, you, know, you know them by heart. You know what, Frank told me something and I absolutely agree with it. He said, if what happened had to happen, it had to happen to me, to Frank, because he said that he knew that it's, it wasn't going to affect him negatively. It was always like a smile on my face. I, he'll never remove that smile. <laughs> Even when I'll die, I have a, a grin on my face. <laughs> yeah, joie de vivre, I mean, joy of life, I mean. My philosophy in life is like never regretting something. Because I know that I will die someday, it could be tomorrow, it could be... In two minutes, could be right after this interview, I get, high, I get hit by a car. So I just want to make sure that the moment I will die, I won't have any regrets. So how I live, I want to live like that. It will take eight hours of trekking and a 2,600 foot elevation gain before the soldiers navigate up the valley into that night's destination the ancient trading village of Namche Bazaar. They will spend two days at Namche, acclimatizing at an altitude of 11,300 feet.
The ancient trading village of Namche Bazaar sits in a natural amphitheater carved from the slopes of the Khumbu Valley. It has been the heart of Himalayan commerce in the region for over 400 years. Once the crossroads of nomadic Tibetan salt traders and Kathmandu spice merchants, Namche today still continues to pump essential supplies up into some of the most remote communities in the world. 60 years since Sir Edmund Hillary first walked its narrow cobblestone streets, Namche Bazaar is still the gateway for all mountaineering expeditions who intend climbing in the Everest region. While mobile phones and internet access have joined the list of necessities desired by most Sherpa people, they do little to detract from the colorful market stalls that lend texture to Namche's medieval charm. Ah, just looking. You know, I was going to check the shops that are... You got some singing bowls down there. Actually, you got some right there. Gotta, always got to check the shops that are at the end of, like, the dead end street. Yeah, so, sometimes nice. they have the good deals. I'm really shocked at the money exchange and, uh, you know, some of the stores taking Visa and MasterCard. Uh, I'm really blown away by the internet. Uh, cafes and the fact that, uh, you know, the Sherpas porters are all on cell phones. I, I definitely wasn't expecting it to be like that. Right now we're heading to an internet cafe. Oh, we went last night day. and we got emails from our family and Hello. there's the two of us having hot chocolate and crying. We got super supportive emails, which Yes. Oh, it felt so good. Our littlest is six, and he still comes running in around two, three in the morning. It's the little things that you stop and you realize are worth it. My, uh... I need to get out of the way. <laughs> I've worn one of these ever since I was in Afghanistan. I uh, worked with some Gurkhas over there. tree line and we start seeing snow but I'm, I'm prepared for that I got all the warm gear so I should be good that's my my thought process we'll, we'll see in the uh, next week <laughs> went through with her injury, how much they've endured and suffered. You look at how happy these kids are with their minimalistic lifestyle and what we have at home. And it really, or I just want to grab really them. makes you appreciate what you have. <laughs> grab them and squeeze them. <laughs> As a mother of four and with a husband still serving in the military, Michelle Quinton Hickey understands the impact that a military life can have on families. As a 22-year veteran of the CF, Michelle served in Afghanistan before being medically released due to injuries she sustained in training. Based in Kingston, she continues to work as a nurse case manager for the Canadian Forces. One of the key phrases I find myself saying a lot of times is, just because you're not fit for CF doesn't mean you're not fit for real life. I'll get people coming into my office all the time that think, that this is the end of a road and they, they have a really difficult time seeing anything beyond, you know, what they're, what they're engulfed in right now and the injury and they think that it's the end of a road for them rather than a beginning. And a lot of my job is about trying to change that perspective. If it's somebody that's only been in for a few years, sometimes it's easier for them to see 
oh, well, I tried this, it's not going to work out, so let's look at new opportunities. Whereas somebody who's been in 10 or 12 years, and their expectation, they've got a young family, they've got, you know, their career was going to be the, the, the military. And then all of a sudden, that takes a, a hard left or right. Uh, it's very difficult for someone to get their head wrapped around or a new direction or, or what, what if they want to be outside of the CF because they've never given it another thought. Oh, yes. Cheers, boys. Hey, girls. Cheers. Cheers. Shall be here for 1,440 meters. Mm. It's day five of the expedition, and the team makes its way through the increasingly treacherous terrain, leading them higher into the mountains and towards one of the most iconic places in Nepal. Surrounded by the towering Himalayas at 12,700 feet, it is the sacred site for the Sherpa people, whose mountain culture is synonymous with their religion. The remote Buddhist monastery in Tangboche. Within the private sanctum of the Tangboche Monastery, the Island Peak Expedition Team attends a private puja under the watchful eye of the head lama. The ceremony is a traditional blessing of safe passage in the mountains and a sign of respect and good karma within the Sherpa culture. <coughs> We just experienced something amazing uh, back there. We were at Apuja, and then they also blessed us and, on our journey and to provide us protection and safety. And I used to believe in maybe there was something, and I still maybe to this day believe that there is something greater out there. There is fate, but it only takes you so far, and then it's up to the individual person in order to take it the rest of the way. When I got hurt, um, people brought me books when I was in the hospital. And uh, one of the books that they brought me was called The Art of Happiness. And I read it in the mornings. And it brought a lot of peace to me and the philosophy of cultivating happiness and pursuing happiness. If I had to choose a religion, I think I would choose uh, Buddhism. It's, if you read what uh, the Dalai Lama says, it's pretty amazing. It's, it's about spirituality, about love, about yeah, loving a life, you know, and it's what I believe in.
That day, I was distributing books, school books for kids. They didn't like it. So they, they tried to end up that program by killing me. But you know what? This guy, he had this belief. I have mine. Picked up the wrong guy. He tried to kill me. He just made me stronger. That's all he did, making me stronger. Every recovering soldier must find his own bridge back to a new normal. For some, it's a step too far. And the toll for crossing that divide is paid in divorce. Even though modern medicine can save soldiers' lives in the field, too often on their return home, it's their relationships that die. David McDonald was critically injured in Afghanistan in a vehicle rollover. Amongst his myriad of injuries, he bruised 80% of his frontal lobe. Having no memory of the incident, he returned to his love of writing as a way of making sense of what happened to him while on duty and to manage the anger he felt post-tour. It's a very common thing in the CF when guys deploy and come back that their relationships have been, and it could be they've been married for a year, it could be they've been married for 15 years, but they just, it's a completely different dynamic when they get home, and no, they just can't get back to the way it was. You're a different person when you come home, and that person you're with is a different person when you come home. It's, there, it's almost like starting from scratch. It was the divorce, actually, that really kick-started my writing again, because I was, uh, yeah, I was in a really bad place during that time, and I needed to just get things out. I was even more pissed off than I was when I first came home during that time. And uh, it definitely kind of just helped myself kind of work through that time. There are so many families that break up when soldiers come home. Um, and I think too many people wave it off as, oh, that's, you know, that's just life or that's just the way it is, rather than looking to the root of the problem um, and seeing if that, if that uh, soldier really needs some assistance or some help psychologically dealing with what they went through and what they've seen. When I started having kids, I'd come back and I'd basically, I'd take a step back, I'd sit and I'd watch what my, my wife was doing with the children, and I'd actually try to slide my way into the family instead of just barging in and changing everything the family's been doing for six months. I'd just sit back and watch. To learn how she does it that way, it isn't such a massive ripple in life. I just do it, I, I start getting into kind of a destructive phase where just I was doing things that I shouldn't have been doing. And writing kind of allowed me to kind of work my way out of that to kind of come to terms with it and put my thoughts down on paper of what I was going through. I still go hang out with a good buddy I was out overseas with. Two years later, all we talk about is tour. And anyone who come with us, they all tell us, like, you guys are still over there. You haven't come home yet. Towards the end of the first week of the expedition, the soldiers have bonded as a tightly knit group. In the coming days, however, the elevation will increase, and so will the pressure, testing the unity of the team as personal goals come into view. For soldiers, the possibility of death is an everyday reality, just as it is for mountaineers. Above the village of Dugla is a cluster of stone cairns, a somber memorial ground to the fallen climbers of Mount Everest. They are a sobering reminder of man's mortality and the risks involved in a tempting island peak. 
When I was dying, I thought I was dying in Afghanistan. In a certain way, I was happy. I had a good life, I had a great life, and I was, doing, I was dying doing something I liked. For me, that's it. This is mortality. It certainly brings everything into perspective about Everest and the whole area, climbing, how dangerous it is, how exhilarating in a rush it is, but uh, how quickly things can change and, uh, and, uh, and go wrong. This place, to be commemorated here, it's probably one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been to, let alone probably one of the most beautiful places that exist yeah, in this world. Up, Mortality kind of meets like immortality here. Land meets the sky. It's like a big cycle of life here. Can't think of a better place to uh, think of them, the ones that are here and the ones that have passed away then where we are amidst uh, memorials of some of the world's greatest climbers, Canadians and um, international. So that's for Grandpa Mandy, RSM, previous service, amazing guy, passed away a bit ago. fellow Canadian who lost her life in the mountains a few months ago and on our expedition a couple of our guides thought it'd be um, a nice tribute to set up a monument. afraid of death because they don't know what it is but who uh, who knows no one knows so maybe death is actually better than life so you know that's a mentality that also helped me go through uh, what I lived in Afghanistan trying to understand why me why not the others it's just uh, faith destiny whatever you want to call it up to the sun. Other people had cows sticking their head in their window, but uh, I was on the second floor, so. Wake up to a morning kiss, it works. <laughs> Another day, big day today. Ever space camp. Woo! <laughs> going, up, going up to uh, Gord, Shep. Gord Shep, and after that we're making a leap up to base camp. Well, that's not bad, we're only doing 140 meters over three hours. Yeah. Stroll in the park. It was so nice getting an email from home. My husband said, wow, I didn't know all these little things that you did. <laughs> so it's giving him a newfound appreciation of what I do at home. Altitude-wise, I'm not really having any issues, no headaches. I guess because I'm, I'm the oldest uh, soldier on the team, right? So apparently the doctor's saying that your brain's smaller. <laughs> I'm sure my wife would agree with that. Well, we're just about at average base camp with our first view is the Kambu Glacier. I got 5,000 on my watch at meters. So pretty much half the worst atmospheric pressure is gone off our chests. Bodies. All right, all right. Oh, success. 
big challenge, though. Holy. Like, I've been thinking about it for quite a few months now. And to actually stand there and knock that off the list feels good. Definitely a little bit surreal. Sorry, if you can get a picture of me and Brian. Yeah, this is the last choice. No, you had it. I got you lost, remember? So cool. I never thought that I'd see myself here, get here. Pretty tough to push a wheelchair up here. I found myself thinking of my family and Everest, of course, my son, who's 14, a lot of the way up here. and. I've been looking for most of the track for like the perfect rock. <laughs> I can't find one. I think I'll leave it here. We're Gordon. So here we are in a town called Gordon Shep. Yeah, I just saw him near that mountain there straight from the clouds, just sticking his head out. Well, some people call that Mount Everest. Anyway, it's the tallest one in the world. It's kind of neat. We're heading to the space temple over there, and then afterwards, we're going to go climb up this thing for a better view. That's the Caliph Tar over there. The summit of Kalapatar is the last acclimatizing training goal for the soldiers before their attempt on Island Peak. The Himalayas are starting to show their teeth. With 100 kilometer an hour winds, and the physical effects of high altitude beginning to take their toll. I've never thought in a million years I would have to equalize. Oh. Going up a mountain, the same way I would pull up water. Like the highest sats I've hit is 93. And even down back uh, in Vancouver, if you're setting 93 near sea level, you're getting oxygen. It's just, that that's what you need. But apparently up here, it's perfectly normal. It's just the way the altitude goes, so. What you said this morning was 81. And it's gone down as low as 74. <coughs> and home, that's... That's emergency. A minute ago, I got some pain in my inner ear, my right side. You gonna push your head? I'm gonna try. Just want to rest for a second and see if it feels better. In Afghanistan. I didn't know. I knew that there was a risk. I never blamed anybody for that. Never blamed the forces. Never blamed myself. I have to blame. It just is that it's my destiny. It happened. I have to deal with it. So that's why I kept always the morale. Because what can you do? Life is so short. If I start to just cry about what happens to me, there's two ways to see it, huh? Either you see the good way, I still have a one arm, one eye, so I can see my kids growing. I have one, one hand. I can touch them. I can, you know, put them to bed. That's why I like all this with one eye. I can see all this. It's enough. I don't need to.
Like a lot of new troops, when they go over, they come back with a pocket full of money and no real reason to, to save it. So I paid off a few bills, and then I, I parted a lot of it away. There were guys that came home, and they didn't have that uh, family support network, which, again, to me, I, thought, I think is the most important. You know, you're grounded at home and everything else, and, uh, you know, if you don't have that support, then, yeah, you're going to turn to other avenues, unfortunately. I akin it to, like, surfing. You know, when you're on a big wave, you're caught up in the euphoria of things, the nationalistic pride, doing something for your country. And as soon as you get home, it's like being dumped in the sand. Everything's gone. You poke your head up, and the waves continued on, but you're by yourself, basically. You know, two paychecks, and you're picking yourself up and starting over again. Everybody goes through a trauma. And I mean, whether you're military or not, trauma, like it's tough to fight someone's demons in their head. I mean, that's why you have professionals for that. Hardest part is getting them to the professional. Everybody has to, at one point, have to, has to make a conscious decision. You can't make them talk. You, they have to make the decision, that, okay, they wanna, they wanna bring it to the surface. So some guys just bottle it up and wait for that uh, bottle to be full. You know, the guy drinking alone or the girl drinking alone or the person punching walls or yelling at the wind, but it, how do you reach out to them? And especially if you knew them before, that's the, that's the key part, like... And the worst part is, is you treat them normal sometimes, and I mean, that's exactly what they want to be. But for someone going through something, sometimes when you treat them normal, they really hate you, because they think you're lying to them. Life's never in a single way, huh? It's always a... It's give and take, and so you cannot always take. You have to give also. If somebody always take, at a certain point, people will be tired of giving it to you. Sometimes they need, they need to receive also. A physical injury is, um, it's almost like it's verified, it's validified. And a lot of the soldiers that come into my office you know, by by the time I'm done the interview, um, I'm finding that you know their their alcohol or drug use is um, off the charts and out of control, and there's family issues and um, and like I say, I've had that in my own home life. I do see how um, someone could slip into addiction, having been in a lot of pain for a long time medications can lead to one thing to the next thing you know n before you know it the house is on the line the family's fallen apart um, we're trying to pull together resources to to keep soldiers in their houses and it just it can be devastating i mean what's going in their head i don't know in my head something may be different that's what's going on in their head and i'm not on their head so it's pretty hard to say but uh, yeah, some people will go with the bottles, some people will go with drugs, some people will quit the army after one tour because uh, they don't fit in that pattern anymore. It's sad, but it's like this. I've seen, and I've done it myself, you burn out friends. Like you, when you start dumping on people, you really start burning them out and it's, it's tough. But yeah, I mean, I hope that with this, there's, I gotta tell you, there was times there I would have loved to have a phone number just to call. Because you can only burn people out so much. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't want to fucking think about this shit at all. It's day 12 of the expedition, and bodies are starting to break down. 
The high altitude terrain is grueling for even the fittest of individuals. But for the soldiers, they must contend with the additional burden of pre-existing injuries. The team doctor does what he can. But with Island Peak just two days away, the clock is ticking. Yeah, I'm good at Twitch there. You okay? Forget to breathe. Oh. You felt the shock there. Yeah. Okay, that's a good sign. We'll just leave that one there. That's... Well, this morning, I was worried. I don't want to not be able to make the summit without with my leg. Right now, it's the worst feeling I've ever had in that knee, my needle in my knee. And the cause is what we're trying to do here is more important than personal pain. So. After establishing camp at 15,500 feet at the base of Island Peak, the soldiers brace themselves for what will be an epic two-day ascent to the top. Their plan is to pitch a bivouac camp 3,000 feet higher up the mountain by the end of the first day. From this alpine perch, they will set off early the next morning on a final push for success. But with falling oxygen levels, bone-chilling cold, and the dangers of the upper mountain, Island Peak Summit won't come easy. This is my kids, my kid and my, my girl. So, yeah, I mean, I've been away from home for a long period of time before. This is the first time I've been away from a family. I'm pretty far away right now. I am thinking of my family there behind me every step of the way, almost pushing me up the mountains, but I gotta stay focused on the objective. It's a greater purpose than mine alone to get up there. I got to uh, use a satellite phone yesterday and talk to my husband. And he said, every step you take, when you feel like you can't go any further, we're right behind you, helping you push forward. And I know they are, I can feel it. So, yeah, I miss home. Or 4.25. Uh, we didn't sleep very good. It was very cold. But it uh, doesn't matter. I mean, we're here for one goal. And mm -hmm. We're done. The peak. <laughs> porridge, porridge. Good energy. Anxious. Worried, but... Yeah, if you pan the camera back in the back, they're hanging up by the sunglasses as their knee braces, too. <laughs> Yeah. I'm definitely yeah, out of my comfort zone, but like Michelle said, one boot in front of the next. With the dawn of summit day, a final set of challenges awaits the soldiers. It will be a lung-bursting exercise in negotiating rock walls and crevasse-strewn snowfields before they face Island Peak's notorious near vertical headwall and summit ridge. It's easier to, to go farther when you have something to focus on. If we don't have that common enemy to, to fight and surpass, it's, we're just, we're, we're going aimlessly. So we, do, we don't come together as a team as well if we don't have that, that common goal.
one of the hardest things that we have being soldiers and like myself, you know, retired soldiers, um, you have your mind set on the objective and you finish at all costs or you, you know, you make sure you get your job done, and then you worry about the problems. But in this scenario, you really have to bring out every little tiny point as it happens and deal with it because it can turn in a millisecond into a really big thing. Michelle and I were talking in the tent the other night. I think I'm like 16 months since my last big surgery and Michelle's got one coming up in what, November? So to even be here, like, pretty cool. certain mentality when you're out with your friends that aren't, you know, civilians, people who haven't been in the military, you have a certain mentality. And then when you're with a bunch of soldiers, it's a whole different mentality. It's amazing how the game changes just a little. It's not so much, let's go extreme, but at the same time, it's like, let's do this together. And you end up doing something extreme as a huge group that you wouldn't normally think of, you know? Once you've spent time in the military, it, it's a family, and uh, it, it never leaves your uh, never leaves your soul. Really, it's like uh, it's like we've served together uh, anywhere with this group. It's, uh, it's actually really inspiring. There's a head ball. Almost straight up. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Piece of cake. Every time I'm going uphill, all of a sudden you're really short of breath. Um, and I don't think it really matters how fit you are. You're you just start to get get out of breath because you're you're not getting as much oxygen in. But you just gotta hunker down and, and rely on you know mindset that you know you can do this. Tough than it looks. <laughs> feel it. This is the hardest thing I've ever done. <sighs> what has been hard is uh been hospitalized for three months and uh, I was in shape then I went to rock bottom so climbing back to get in shape again is pretty hard it reminds me of uh, when we were in Afghanistan it's the same things it's an adrenaline rush it's team spirit and it's getting to the top no matter what I just can't, can't imagine myself not being on top of that mountain. I prefer to die. I was pretty sure I lost my lungs back there. What little breath I had, I was praying I could uh, make it up here. So one step at a time. That rock climb took a lot out of me, and I had to stop for a second and and give myself a little pep talk on why I'm doing this. Because uh, it would have been really easy to turn around. But uh, you know what? For a lifetime of memories, three hours of pain. We'll talk again when we get to the top. As the expedition team breaks the 19,000 foot barrier and makes the final push to the summit, Michelle has fallen behind. Her oxygen levels have plummeted into the danger zone and she can't continue. She must go down to base camp where, as a precautionary measure, a helicopter will take her to a lower altitude. As a team, out as a team, that's what it's about. And were you to ask any one of us, we'd say the same thing. There's nothing that could have made me leave one of my fellow soldiers in a state 
um, a vulnerability. Hey, Ethan, it's Mummy. Sometimes it's more important to stick together as a team. And when one or two people aren't well, then that's the priority. So I didn't get all the way up to the top, but I got almost all the way up to the top. And that's all that matters. So I love you and thanks. It's, you know, I didn't get the check in the box technically, but I feel in my soul that I did. I summited with my teammates. I was surprised that I didn't get sick before. And then, like that last kilometer just before, everything just went for crap. That's one of the worst things is, uh, you know, you start with them, I remember getting off the plane with them, and you just want to finish with them. I just said, just wish I didn't have to leave. The soldier team pushes their minds and bodies past 20,000 feet. Along a knife edge ridge with a 1,000 foot drop on either side. Surrounded by the highest mountains on earth, the summit of Island Peak is finally within reach. We couldn't even imagine ourselves being here without one each other. It's that moral support thing. It's that real good moral support that drives me on. <laughs> I think I worked through a lot of issues just hanging out with the guys here, actually. That's all the old saying, you're not alone, you know. And I really, I'm really happy that I was able to, to push my injury to the, to the limits and still be able to walk off the hill. Oh, meant a lot. Uh, to put it in words, that's a different story. A year and a half ago, I couldn't breathe by myself. Look at me now, with friends, climbing Allen Peak. And we, we all did it. We all got injured. We all got injured, and we all did it. So it's just a proof that when you want something, you can get it. That's a proof. 